Why do you care? What's the big deal? It's just a movie, a series, a novel. It's just an old painting, sculpture, a statue. Do you even know what that represents? A stupid old building? It's just art. Why do you care? What's the big deal? What is your problem? Come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come here, man. I want to tell you all something. Just between you and me, we care about art a whole lot. A f***ing whole lot. I can attack so I cast. Before I get into talking about why we care so much, I have to address the consequences of not caring. An incident that sent shockwaves throughout American culture. The brutal assault and murder of Kitty Genovese. For those of you all not familiar, in 1960s New York City, Kitty Genovese was a nurse walking home from the late shift when she was brutally assaulted and then murdered in a small public space. Assault and murder? Sadly, in big cities, that's just a statistic. What made everybody sit up and take notice? Overlooking this small public space were hundreds of apartments. They found over 100 people saw or heard everything that happened. And this incident took a long time. No one intervened, and no one could even be bothered to call the police. Why? The simple answer? No one cared that just feet from their window, a woman was begging for her life. The little public space wasn't in the seedy part of town, the slums or the projects. And the people who couldn't be bothered? They weren't bums or criminals, or worse, poor people. This was a relatively affluent part of town. And the people that let everything happen were mostly professionals. Some of them actually worked at City Hall. As you all can imagine, there was a lot of research done on this incident. It was found that the people who saw and heard everything, they cared. They actually cared a great deal. So why didn't they get involved? Because they didn't think it was their responsibility. What the researchers had found is that no one had taken personal ownership of that public space. They felt like it was the responsibilities of that space's owners to put a stop to what was going on. Because they hadn't taken personal ownership, they didn't care what happened in that space. Leastways, they didn't care enough to get involved. When you take possession, and I'm not talking about legal, I'm talking about mental here. When you take possession of something, you internalize it. You make it your own. When you take possession, you think you own something, and it doesn't matter if it's physical, like a space, or can even be an idea. People are oftentimes willing to die to protect what they think they own. The Kitty Genovese incident fundamentally changed how architects think about space and buildings. We are taught to design buildings and space that encourage people to take possession, to internalize, make their own. That raises the $64,000 question. How in the blue blazes do you do that? What's the purpose of art? Art communicates, but it goes deeper than that. How I like to phrase it, art is the attempt to express an idea that cuts across time and space, culture and religion, ethnicity and race, with the goal of touching the human soul. Randy, how in the hell do you touch the human soul? <laughs> well, that's the mystery of art. You answer that question and you'll unlock the secrets of the universe. What we do know that every work of art that has touched the human soul has one thing in common, meaning. This is where interpretation comes into play. An artist will create a work of art. Painting, movie, novel, comic book, doesn't really matter. And then they will go around telling everybody their interpretation of what that art means. When an individual encounters a particular work of art, they interpret what they think it means. If that meaning connects with them on a personal level, they begin to value the art. They internalize it, make it their own, take possession. Groups of individuals with similar backgrounds, experiences, and worldviews will oftentimes form similar interpretations of a particular work of art's meaning. The group will begin to value that work of art. The group will take possession of that work of art. 
On all too rare occasions, a work of art can transcend art, become cultural. The culture at large takes ownership over the work of art. They take possession. If you destroy somebody else's property, the owner of that property is going to get pissy. And if you keep destroying that property, even after the owner tells you to stop, you're going to make an enemy. An enemy that holds a grudge with a very long memory. Let me give you all an example of how this works with art. In this case, architecture. Have you all heard the urban legend of Ozzy Osbourne pissing on the Alamo? As the story goes, he was promptly arrested, fined, and then kicked out of the state of Texas, told to never come back. It's irrelevant if that urban legend is true or not. What matters is why people are willing to believe the story. Here in Texas, that humble little building of brick and mud is sacred soil. The events that happened there carry deep personal meaning for a lot of Texans. It's believable that the state of Texas would react with such hostility towards a blatant act of disrespect. What do you all think would happen if somebody showed up at the Alamo, started trashing the place? Do you think everybody would just stand around, let it happen? I'll tell you all what I think. I think they would be begging the police come and protect, I mean arrest them, haul them off to jail. Randy, I don't care about the Alamo, okay? How would you feel if somebody showed up with a baseball bat and started trashing Falling Water or the Gamble House or started destroying Monet paintings? Wait a minute. They're already destroying Monet paintings. They will come for something that you love. So far, I've been talking about psychology and architectural theory. Yeah, you'd be surprised how much overlap there is between the two. Let's switch gears a minute and go anecdotal. Talk about lived experience my lived experience. Why do I care about art? Well, it all can be traced back to Saturday nights when I was a kid and the late movie on Color 10 out of Springfield. I would intentionally stay awake to hear what movie was going to play. Tonight on the late movie, Errol Flynn and his band of merry men fight against the evil Prince John in The Adventures of Robin Hood. Woohoo! I'd jump up, run down the hall, poke my head around the door into the living room. Dad, can I watch this with you? More often than not, because I got pretty good at guessing what he'd let me watch, he'd say, come on in, pull up a chair. Let's watch this together. After the movie was over, more often than not, we would spend hours talking about what I'd seen. Saturday nights became precious, the highlight of my week. Now that I have my little girl, I've come to realize that Saturday nights were precious to my father as well. When I was in trouble, grounded even, more often than not, he would still let me come out, watch the movie, and talk with him. Although he'd always make a point as I headed off to bed, little buddy, you're still grounded. Yes, sir. Recently, I watched one of those old movies again for one of my video critiques. When the movie was over, I stood up, turned, and almost tripped over the couch. I was confused and disoriented. Couldn't figure out why the couch was in the wrong spot. Took me a couple seconds to figure out what was going on. I had gotten so wrapped up in the movie, I was transported back to when I was a kid. So when it was over, muscle memory kicked in. I got up and automatically went to go sit by my dad so we could talk. Had one of those real bittersweet moments. I've always been an avid reader. My dad would say, you know, this movie's based upon a book, so I'd hot-foot it to the library to check me out a book. It was through this avid reading that my 14-year-old self discovered J.R.R. Tolkien. Mind blown. I've always been open about the fact that in my late teens, I lost my relationship with my father due to his addictions. As he sank deeper into his addictions, he became more and more abusive. The Lord of the Rings was one of the novels that I turned to for moments of peace. It's one of the reasons why I'm still here, still sane. At this point, I've probably read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings a dozen times, and I've lost track of how many times I just opened up a random page and started reading. I've wore out multiple copies of the book. When they announced the movies, I was both excited and nervous. You know what they say. The book is always better than the movie. 
and fantasy, it's very hard to translate from the written to the visual. I didn't want to see the movie by myself, so I invited one of my best friends to go. My friend had never read Tolkien, so why did I want her to go with me? Besides the fact that she's my friend, I enjoy her company. Her dissertation was on Shakespeare. She's literally a Shakespearean scholar. I really wanted to hear her opinion on the story. After the movie, we go across the street to get some coffee and dessert. After we were settled at her table, I asked her, what did you think? She got a big cheese-eating grin and said, I loved it. I said, really? What did you love about it? At one point, she was so excited, got so animated, she jumps up and starts acting out the scene. Now, the coffee shop was full of people pretty much like us who had just come over from the movie. So most of them stopped what they were doing and watched her. Of course, she realized she had an audience, so she starts hamming it up. When she sat down, when she finished, she got an applause. <laughs> Needless to say, every time I see that scene, I have a mental image of my friend acting silly in a coffee shop. After we finished our dessert, she insisted that we go over to the bookstore. At first, she wanted to buy everything that had Tolkien's name on it. I said, no, 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 slow down, cowboy. Just buy The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Make sure you're into them before you go down the rabbit hole. Wait a minute. How come I'm the one that had to carry the books back to campus? And she calls herself a feminist. That's just the Cliff's Notes version. I could go on for hours all the reasons I care about art. I cared enough to go to college, get a professional master's in architecture. I cared enough to continue studying, to become an expert in aesthetics. I cared enough that when I saw censorship, destruction of art, I couldn't keep my big fat yap shut. My willingness to let my cake hole draw flies is one of the reasons why I had to leave academia. And I cared enough that I was willing to sacrifice 18 years of hard work. So yeah, you might say I care. And if you have a problem with that, I have no problem telling y'all which train to take. Here's the thing. Hollywood, Disney, people like Bob Iger, Kathleen Kennedy, Leslie Headland, they know exactly what they're doing. The destruction is intentional. In an art form that is completely dependent upon the audience's goodwill, no audience dollars, no Hollywood, for generations, directors, studios, and even actors have been trying to crack the formula, find the secret sauce that will make their movie transcend art and become owned by the culture at large. The formula is so difficult to crack that most actors and directors, when they do figure it out, they only do it once. Jackson got three. Lucas got a franchise. Just a few examples. Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, The Maltese Falcon, Godfather, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars. What do you all think are the films that cracked the formula, became part of the culture? And then in the last couple of years, Hollywood has completely reversed course. They have begun to systematically take every single film that the culture lays claim to and destroy them. It's more than destruction. They're taking a baseball bat to it. And what remains? They pour gasoline over it and torch it. They're doing it out of vindictiveness and spite, spitting in the faces of the owners. What? You say you don't really care about movies, novels, comic books? They're not really hard anyhow, so what's the big deal? They will come for something you do care about. Do you all realize that in some quarters, there's already a movement to cancel Frank Lloyd Wright? What? Cancel Frank Lloyd Wright? Why? Well, if you get past the justifications and you dig down into the real reasons, politics. Well, mix in the little old-fashioned jealousy as well. Do you all realize that the American landscape is primarily the result of two people, Thomas Jefferson and Frank Lloyd Wright. We all know why they're coming after Jefferson. They're pulling down his statues, taking his name off buildings and streets, neighborhoods, parks, towns. They're trying to systematically remove him from the landscape. If they have their way, they will erase him from history. What's Frank Lloyd Wright's crime? He believed that what made America special was its middle class. 
and he tried to design an architecture and environments that promoted and nurtured that middle class. He has to go. Movies, novels, comic books, Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, they're middle class art. They promote middle class values and ideals. You want to destroy the middle class? Economics only work up to a certain point. Being middle class is a mindset. If you really want to destroy the middle class, you destroy their culture. If some people get their way and Frank Lloyd Wright is canceled, it won't be long before the bulldozers start rolling. They will erase him from the landscape and they will erase him from history. Gandhi said when talking about oppressors, they will use three tactics. First, they ignore you. Then they ridicule you. Then they attack you. Then you win. We are in the attack stage at this point. Hollywood is starting to realize the gig's up. Everybody's on to them. It's clear as day what's going on. So what they're trying to do, as they pour the gasoline and flick their bicks, they're screaming, if you try to stop us, you're ists and phobes. The problem with this tactic? Who cares about the opinions of vandals and arsons? All Hollywood is doing at this point, making new enemies. New enemies that hold grudges and have long memories. If you stuck with me this far, I have one more question for y'all. Why do you care about movies, novels, comic books, architecture, or any type of art? Tell me down in the comments below. At any rate, I hope I've given y'all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If y'all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.